Okay, welcome everyone to this 2021 annual meeting update presentation. And thank you all for joining us today. My name is Don Bubar, President and CEO of Avalon. Been in this position for 26 years now. And looks like this is going to be a big year for Avalon. So I'm pleased to have everyone here to get the uh, update here today. Your reminder not to rely on all the forward looking statements I'll be making here today. Next slide is our update on our uh, corporate information. And I guess the, uh, the main thing here is that um, we've hit a market cap of 100 million in the last little while with the recent uh, movement in the share price based on um, <clears throat> the 350 million sh shares we have roughly outstanding right now. We still have a very diverse widespread shareholder base um, and many, many loyal shareholders who have been shareholders for 15 years and longer, actually. The, that always inspires me to keep plugging away here and really get things going and create value for our shareholders who have been so patient. And we're in not bad shape financially right now after that financing we did and um, announced in January. We now have about three and a half million um, dollars in the bank, so adequately funded for near-term needs and plenty of new opportunities for us going forward here. And one of those is based on our commitment, long-time commitment to sustainable mineral development and being producing these annual sustainability reports. As most of you are aware, we engage Sustainalytics to do an audit of our business practice this year to generate an ESG risk rating. And we got that now and disclosed it yesterday as hopefully you're all aware. And that opens up a lot of new doors for us in terms of um, accessing capital from this rapidly growing ESG investment community. So here's some of the information that was provided in their report. And it's something probably a lot of uh, you have not seen before. And it um, was my first experience with uh, seeing how it's done too. And basically the number, the lower the better in terms of your risk on uh, being non-compliant on the ESG issues. So uh, our rating was very good, ranked right up there in the top 5% of the companies that we were compared with in the um, mining industry. And um, we're quite far, far ahead compared to our peers, um, but basically those were based on market cap, but the next closest one was uh, 55.8, well below us. So there weren't any issues that were raised in terms of our policies and practices. Uh, we basically have a very good report card that I believe will open up more doors for us to access um, capital on a non-dilutive uh, basis using new tools such as green bonds. So some of the uh, progress and highlights to report on over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, we're making, finally making good uh, headway on our uh, lithium project. As most of you know, we've been working on that project for 25 years now and our time has finally come. There's a lot of interest in getting the uh, lithium battery material supply chains uh, started here now and uh, in Ontario. And because of that, we have um, had a vision for creating a refinery in a central location in uh, Northwestern Ontario. And Thunder Bay is an ideal location because of its proximity to infrastructure. And so we announced in uh, January with a, another aspiring producer in, um, in Ontario, Rock Tech Lithium, on a plan to collaborate on trying to get that established. And we're now getting quite a bit of momentum on that as I'll tell you a bit more about later. We reactivated our uh, lily pad cesium tantalum project, had been inactive for almost 20 years, but um, there's a global shortage of cesium now, lots of new interests. So it's time to reactivate that. A little bit more on that later. And then as you probably saw, we announced um, recently here, the acquisition of um, the new project opportunity. We've been looking for new closed mine sites that might offer this kind of opportunity, extract value from the waste while remediating a long-term environmental liability. And this one that um, this 
Cargill site, Northeastern Ontario, looks really interesting for rare earths and some other elements in the um, tailings as well. <clears throat> so a lot of uh, circumstances now are leading to increased investor interest. Um, a lot of it's been basically external factors in terms of this growing interest in creating the new critical mineral supply chains here in Canada and our recognition as having been a leader in this space for quite a long time. But in particular, the, um, the threat of China imposing new rare earth export quotas again is um, a very significant factor because of course that's what caused that big boom in rare earth prices back in 2010. And in the, the United States, we're still very well known as a rare earth equity. And um, whenever there is uh, news media coverage on this being um, uh, a big risk factor going forward, there's always a positive reaction in terms of interest in, in Avalon in the marketplace. So given the news we've heard recently, it's looking like 2010 all over again. And the stock chart from 15 years back will give you an idea of what I'm referring to when I say 2010 all over again. And you can see the big price spike that happened between 2010 and 2011 that was uh, related to that um, China's rare earth policy at the time. And uh, we had um, a relatively advanced rare earth project at Nechalacho, almost got into production at that time before the um, Chinese decided to relax those export quotas, the prices dropped and we couldn't quite get that ball over the line, but thought it might happen, there might be another day for rare earths. And sure enough, that's, we're seeing that now. And you can see that in uh, recent action in the stock market back in 2019, uh, we saw evidence of this when um, Xi Jinping visited the rare earths plant in southern China with a trade negotiator with them, and that caused a huge spike in trading volumes and activity in our stock there, just based on that news coverage in the U.S. So a reminder then, and then it's been starting to uh, rebound ever since um, with the um, growing awareness of the risk that that represents to all of business here in North America and defense in the United States. So that's probably one of the bigger factors impacting our recent share price movement and um, our announcement on having another rare earth asset to start to look at bringing along behind it certainly is um, helping as well. In terms of our um, current management team, not too many changes there. On the board of directors, we welcomed a, a new director, Marilyn Spink, last June after our longtime chairperson, Brian McKechn, decided to uh, retire. And um, Marilyn is a great addition to our team as a very experienced metallurgical and materials uh, engineer. And then on the management uh, side, important new addition to our team has been um, Zishan Syed who has um, joined us as uh, first as a consultant on government relations, but um, that's been such an important part of our business the last year or so, educating government on this, what needs to be happen in terms of, to make these critical mineral supply chains happen here. Uh, Zishan has been in a very important role and doing a great job for us. So we've made him um, a full-time member of the team now as our manager of government affairs and new business development. So speaking to the government relations uh, work, <clears throat> basically um, there's now starting to be more and more awareness in government of the importance of creating these supply chains and reducing our reliance on China as a sole source of supply. And um, because we have been in this space for a long, long time, it is, um, um, we are very well recognized as one of the leaders in this space in government and have been asked to uh, assist in um, how they can address this issue and develop the, the needed uh, regulatory policy to um, enable these new supply chains to be, um, be created. 
So we've been uh, very actively involved in that, making recommendations both at the federal level and the uh, provincial level on steps that need to be uh, taken. We've been pointing out for some time that um, one of the things that has held us up is the lack of pilot plant facilities where we that we can get access to to do the specialized um, process test work to define our most efficient extraction technology and play a role in innovating uh, new technology. <clears throat> then um, there's also um, um, issues in terms of the regulations that regulate the uh, mining industry that were always created for the traditional industry and don't recognize how different this um, new emerging critical mineral spaces and need to be updated. And we've been providing some um, advice to the provincial government here in Ontario on, on how they uh, should uh, look at that and update the regulations to better facilitate the development of these supply chains. And um, government now is looking at providing financial support for um, inspiring new developers of these supply chains through multiple programs, both uh, federally and provincially that we're uh, looking forward to be able to take advantage of. Reminder on our uh, project, um, Database here, oh, major changes except for the, uh, the addition of this new uh, Cargill closed mine site, past producing uh, phosphate mine with all sorts of interesting um, opportunities to recover critical minerals from the waste. And that's something that we have been looking at as an opportunity for uh, some time now, uh, originally with our East Kempville project down in Nova Scotia. And, we still see that as a good opportunity, although we've been uh, delayed on that recently, we're still optimistic there. But um, we've been trying to basically um, help government better understand that many of these historical off mining operations that were developed decades ago for one bulk commodity such as copper may have contained many other critical minerals um, in the resource that had no market then, but do now, but because they weren't needed or recognized as having any value at the time, we're simply discarded in the waste. So these wastes should now be treated as opportunities to sustainably recover these critical minerals using new technologies while remediating the long-term liability. And it's taken a while to get people to see this opportunity, but it is starting to uh, catch on now. And perhaps more of these closed sites that government has inherited as responsibilities and treated as no-go zones may be opened up for um, entrepreneurial companies like Avalon with ideas on innovating new process technologies to do it responsibly and not impact the environment should be given access to look at these sites again as opportunities. So this is um, getting some traction and um, as I mentioned before, this Cargill one, I hopefully we can um, get that going here quickly and, and create a real positive precedent for exactly this type of opportunity and how it can be um, established here and probably many other sites here in Canada and contribute to this whole concept of creating the circular economy that is um, very getting very, very popular, especially with ESG investors. And another area that I have been um, trying, reminding people on, many people probably saw the opinion piece that I wrote and co-authored with my good friend, uh, former National Chief Phil Fontaine, on, that was published in the Globe and Mail a couple of weeks ago, on the opportunity now for First Nations to take advantage of this uh, whole new world that's emerging on these critical mineral supply chains. There are many such resources in the North that now can be looked at positively as opportunities to be developed by Indigenous business. There's more and more First Nations that see this opportunity and want to get into the business as active partners initially and maybe developers on their own ultimately. And one of the things I've been trying to point out is that in many cases, because these critical minerals do not necessarily have um, unlimited demand, demand may be just getting started. 
they don't have to be viewed as large scale expensive operations to get started. They can be developed at a small scale with minimal environmental impacts, get them in the business and then create growth opportunities uh, going forward. So we think that um, this is um, something that should be talked about and promoted by uh, government and is starting to um, get some attention there. So we also think there's going to be more and more opportunities to um, uh, create downstream value added clean technology businesses that, that the indigenous business could participate in too including lithium battery materials. And we've got such a conversation already uh, happening now in uh, Thunder Bay that has got the interest of the Fort William First Nation. So moving on to the project updates here, for starting with uh, Separation Rapids, as I've said, our most advanced project. We've had a long time. It's still a very high quality resource. Didn't think it would take this long to be able to uh, realize some real value here, but our time has definitely come. And uh, we are now gonna take advantage of all that work we did historically to uh, move forward, both with the opportunity to serve the glass ceramic markets that we've looked at for years, and also um, look at getting started on the battery materials and help get that whole supply chain started quickly here in, uh, in Ontario. There's a map showing the mineral tenure, and I show this mostly to show how off to the left there is a group of claims that we added, purchased in 2017, that have good exploration potential for similar LCT pegmatites. And we discovered one last year that is called Snowbank, that is actually a very interesting prospect. So while we have a good large resource at Separation Rapids there, there's going to be good opportunities here to expand the resources um, on our land position at Separation Rapids going forward, especially if the um, market demand continues to grow. And here's a bit of information on that uh, new snowbank discovery. We have not yet drilled it, but as you can see in the picture on the left, it is uh, very well exposed. And the numbers we got from some initial uh, sampling on surface there are pretty impressive actually, um, getting up to two and a half percent lithium oxide in um, a 1.1 meter channel. That means half the rock is consisting of um, pedalite. And the other thing that's got our attention there that's a little different from uh, separation rapids and beneficial in some ways is the fact that it's uh, relatively coarse grained compared to a lot of the pedalite in our separation rapids resource, which will make it a little bit easier to um, uh, process and recover some of the types of pedalite products that are now being uh, needed for specific glass ceramic market opportunities. So we plan to do some more uh, work on this year and start doing some drilling on it to uh, see what kind of potential resource we have there but it's quite long and wide and lots of room for significant resource to be established there. A reminder on the mineralogy, as most of you know and probably heard, pedalite is the uh, main mineral in the resource, a very rare lithium mineral. That's a very high purity lithium aluminum silicate, a little bit less lithium in it than uh, spodumene, but also much lower in the impurities that you do not want in your final uh, products, both for the glass markets and in the battery materials. So it's actually um, quite attractive mineral for multiple market opportunities because of those uh, properties. And there's a second lithium mineral in the resource called uh, lipidolite, that's a lithium mineral with that kind of purplish color that uh, is also very appropriate now for uh, processing to recover the lithium for the um, uh, battery materials. There are a number of companies already doing this now to make a battery grade lithium carbonate. So we have um, more than one mineral in the resource that can um, contribute to the market opportunities. As I mentioned earlier, now I'm pretty keen to um, work on getting this battery 
materials refinery established in uh, Thunder Bay that can take concentrates from separation rapids as well as other uh, pr producers down the road to make the battery materials that are going to be needed here in Ontario and elsewhere. And we're getting a lot of interest in that from the um, uh, government to support this because now that they've made that commitment to getting electric vehicles manufactured here and the batteries, it's an obvious opportunity to um, um, create the supply chains that the manufacturers will need. And as I've pointed out many times, we've got them all on the ground. Let's get going on getting them out to make those materials. They're listening now. So with that in mind, we, um, we actually have uh, been talking to some of the other aspiring producers about collaboration. One of them, uh, Rock Tech Lithium, sees or has a similar vision as we do on this. And um, we signed an LOI back in November to work towards collaboration on this uh, refinery because we can design it to accept concentrates of different types from different um, uh, producers and to make different lithium products. We want to be uh, flexible because this market is continuing to evolve and we don't know exactly what the um, future battery, lithium battery materials will, uh, makers will need. So you want to be adaptable and flexible on that. And uh, Thunder Bay actually has quite a few um, ideal industrial sites on the waterfront there that are available, including one that's on uh, Fort William First Nation reserve lands, which is already zoned for industrial development. And they are quite interested in partnering with us on this uh, project too. So I think um, we've got um, a lot of things kind of lining up there and, um, and also good interest from government and providing us with some support to get this thing going and make it easier for us to access the rest of the capital needed to get it built and into operation. But we haven't forgotten about the uh, glass ceramic market and um, what you don't hear a whole lot about it, but it's actually uh, growing too. There's so many areas of now where there's um, new innovation using new technologies and um, glass ceramics is one of them. There's a whole lot of new um, uh, creations there on high strength glass products, including high strength flexible glass, almost all of which rely on uh, lithium as a critical ingredient to impart those properties. And pedalite is still very much a preferred form of feed to uh, make these products. So we've got uh, still got good conversations going. The challenge has always been to um, uh, be able to make samples of the product so the customers can try it out without having a pilot plant set up for what your flow sheet is. It's difficult to uh, be able to do that easily, but um, the interest is definitely there. We're now in the process of taking a bulk sample to um, allow us to do that. So the next steps going forward is um, get going on that bulk sampling program that we've been trying to get going on for uh, several years now. But um, with the recent funding we uh, raised in that uh, financing in January, we're going ahead with that uh, program now to extract as much as we can of the 5,000 tons um, before the um, spring breakup conditions and take advantage of the frozen conditions to get in there. And uh, then we're looking at a number of um, possibilities on where we can um, get that material uh, process. We've got a couple now and uh, get going with making those samples and firming up the flow sheets to uh, get ourselves positioned for um, finalizing all of that and getting into um, production within the next uh, couple of years. Move on to um, cesium, as I mentioned earlier an element that uh, you don't hear a whole heck of a lot about. It's a relatively obscure element, but um, has many technology applications and lots and lots of potential if you can uh, create the supply. Traditionally, there's been one major source and that has actually been not very far from separation rapids at the uh, Tanko mine in uh, Manitoba. That was always the biggest source of supply of uh, cesium. It was controlled by a company called Cabot Corporation from the US. And uh, one of the things they innovated was a product called uh, cesium formate. That was a high density 
fluid with low viscosity and very stable that was quite valuable and used in as a fluid in uh, drilling deep oil wells. But um, fortunately, they uh, basically ran out of resources there that they could mine due to largely exhausted the resource. And then they ran into some issues at the mine with the stability of the crown pillar and um, we're no longer able to produce any of the cesium mineral there <clears throat> and subsequently decided just to give up and sold the whole division to um, Sinomine. But there's still um, an opportunity now for a new producer to emerge to start to uh, supply that market again, both here and elsewhere. And our lily pad project, uh, we own 100% of, has one of the most, I think, most significant new polycyte resources known anywhere. Here's your uh, reminder on the location. It's not um, particularly close to infrastructure. It's um, not as far north as the Ring of Fire you see at the top of the slide. It's close to um, an indigenous community called Fort Hope of the Iabamatan First Nation. And, um, so relatively isolated, but um, not that far away from winter roads and, um, and some of the expanding logging road networks that are moving uh, northwards from the south. Background on the project, here's there you see the numbers on the claims. So we first staked this back in 1999, believe it or not, and um, originally explored it for tantalum because at that time there was a, um, a big boom in interest in tantalum, a shortage in higher prices. And we, we were able to partner with a tantalum capacitor manufacturer that was desperate for a new supply. And they worked with us for a couple of years. We did a fairly big work program, but then the um, prices came back down and their concern about security of supply dropped a little bit. and. Um, that was as far as we were able to take it at the time. But we knew that there was um, going to be another day there. And one of the uh, interesting things that came out of that program was while we were focused on uh, tantalum, we ended up finding exceptional cesium enrichment in some of these tantalum rich dikes. At the time, there was adequate supply of uh, cesium for the, the market at the time, as defined by Cabot. But um, now we see a huge opportunity here. And that one dike that we drilled uh, for tantalum called the polycyte dike on the left-hand side of the screen, polycyte is the cesium mineral uh, or mineral, um, is actually part of an area where there's going to be a lot more of these pegmatites as indicated by this uh, geochemical anomaly. You can see a number of areas there where there was uh, outcrop, and even if the dike itself wasn't exposed, the rocks around it were highly enriched in cesium, indicating there's probably other um, pegmatites in there, similar to the polycyte dike that uh, would contain significant polycyte. So if there's a lot of exploration potential there, in addition to the one dike that we uh, drilled called the polycyte dike. The other one we drilled called the rubellite dike has polycyte as well, but not as interesting grades as we found at um, the polycyte dike. And here's the numbers from that work. We um, calculated a resource based on that drilling way back then. It, um, we're told that you can't rely on it as because it's a historic resource and it was done before 43101, but we're getting that audited now so it can be uh, 43101 compliant. But that's a very significant um, cesium resource. Uh, I don't know of another one in the world with that kind of tonnage to it. And uh, I mean, it's open to depth, open to long strike, and lots of room for expansion there. But the main thing we have to do there now is um, see what is required to um, process it to concentrate the um, polyocyte. And we've been looking at some uh, possibilities there to do it fairly simply and easily using dry process technology. And um, it's looking quite encouraging, actually. We did some test work using the new self-rag pulse disaggregation uh, process that basically just breaks up the rock with a blast of electricity. And then, um, we're now testing sensor-based ore sorting on it, and we've learned that there's 
has been some work done already to demonstrate that it can be uh, used to uh, identify a polyocyte and make a, a concentrate of the cesium mineral uh, polyocyte. So we're getting some test work done on that right now and we're waiting for those results. But if that works, then um, we've got a real interesting possibility there to take some more bigger samples, prove it up and um, get perhaps get something going very quickly at a small scale to show our ability to be able to serve that market longer term. And then in addition to that, we will continue to do some more um, work there on that big anomaly in the area and see what other resources there, um, there may be to uh, add to what we already see we have at the uh, polyocyte dike. And speaking of sensor-based floor sorting, uh, that we've been looking at this for um, a number of years as, a, as an opportunity and, and um, it's a really neat new technology because it allows you to make a mineral concentrate without the use of water or chemicals at all. So very environmentally friendly process. We first started looking at it as an opportunity at the East Kempville project and um, still think we can uh, use it there actually to, to make a concentrate of uh, cassiterite. But now we're seeing maybe it can work at um, lily pad. And we also were inspired to um, see if it might be applicable at our Natalachal project too. And that's what interested our Australian partners, Cheetah, to take a look at it when they realized that it may work perfectly on the um, T-zone resource there that they are now in, in the process of developing. So this is one of the best examples of a new technology that can create much more efficient ways of recovering critical minerals from resources such as ours and not do it and do it in an environmentally beneficial way. So speaking of East Kempfel, brief update on that. Um, the project's been stalled because um, there was a management change at uh, BHP in late 2019. Uh, we were almost there in terms of having an agreement with them to transition responsibility for the site to Avalon. But the new management uh, hesitated and uh, decided that they, um, they're just too nervous, I guess, uh, <laughs> about the risk of dam failures after the um, incident that they experienced in Brazil and have um, declined to let us continue with the model that we had previously agreed to with them. But um, we will continue to look at um, opportunities on this because there are there's a lot of support in the province for this um, actually to see this thing move ahead. Tin prices as many of you may have noticed are uh, rising now because there is a shortage of supply. We have to remind people too that tin is a technology metal too that's needed in electronics and renewable energy technology. And another point that I've been trying to make here too with the um, provincial government is that it's now being recognized more and more that um, tin grisons like East Kempfel usually have lithium enrichment in the associated with the resource. And we know that's the case at East Kempfel too. We haven't done any work on it really yet, but we do have some evidence uh, of that enrichment from a limited sampling we've done to date. So it's something we want to have a closer look at too. So this is really a good example of a closed mine site where there's lots of potential. And we're optimistic that we'll be able to um, work out an alternative plan to secure the access to the site with the support of the provincial government. So stay tuned for further developments there. We're not giving up on it. And then um, briefly on uh, Natalacho. As I mentioned earlier, we did that deal with um, Cheetah back in 2019 and, and uh, they're moving forward there now. It's looking like they uh, may be able to get um, that T-zone operation started there to produce the bastinocyte concentrates using sensor-based ore sorting. They have got an arrangement now at the Saskatchewan Research Council who have established some process capacity there to send the concentrates there for processing. And they recently announced a uh, deal with an, our Norwegian company called REE Tech on a new separation technology. 
and uh, Cheetah's going to work with them. So I've since announced an offtake agreement with them. So they've been making some pretty darn good uh, progress there. We're still helping them out because uh, we want that to go ahead and uh, get, basically get something started up there that we could ultimately use to getting our original basal zone resource um, into production. That's why we retained ownership of it. These guys get the thing uh, going. Once we get that market established and the demand starts to grow, then we can grow the size of this operation and start to look at the basal zone as a fresh opportunity to create that supply of the heavy rarers. You don't hear them talked about a lot right now, but they are very much in short supply and there is a need to um, establish um, new supplies of the heavy rarers to accompany the many sources of light rarers that are out there. And they're also working closely with the um, uh, local indigenous groups there, which is um, making me happy too. They've got an arrangement now with uh, Dayton Cho to provide some of the um, uh, support on mine development there. So that's pretty well it, just to remind uh, everyone on our uh, vision and mission and uh, keep trying to let people know that we're not your re regular mining company. We, our vision is to move forward and be a leader in creating a whole new um, business here that's really a technology business built on doing things in an ESG responsible way and built on innovation and new technology, both in terms of processing and for the products that can be used in many, many new emerging technologies. So that's our, our vision for how we can create shareholder value. And we really wanna be seen more as a technology and a growth company, not just the junior mining company looking to get taken out by a bigger old fashion mining company. So I think we're on our way to doing that now. It took a few years to get here, but I think we're there. So thank you very much for joining us here today. And I'm sure there's some questions out there. Thanks for that, Don. Uh, we did have a few questions that came through. So I will uh, I'll read them out and give you a chance to answer them. And then if anyone else has a question they'd like to ask, it's just the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can type it in and um, we will get to uh, as many questions as we can. So firstly to Don, uh, do you anticipate that US President Biden's stated goal for more uh, production of lithium batteries, rare earth minerals, pharmaceuticals, and computer chips in the US, coupled with China's apparent desire to reduce mining exports, will that have an immediate direct effect upon Avalon's operations? or more indirectly via downstream US production partners? Absolutely. In fact, it already has, as I mentioned early on, in terms of investor interest in Avalon because we are so well known as a rare earth equity. But this is having um, an immediate impact in terms of interest, both in the US and in Canada, on moving forward as quickly as we can to get these um, supply chains started. And we're in the fortunate position of having a good exposure to both rarers and lithium, which are the two that are getting the uh, most publicity now. So yes, this has had a positive impact and it's going to continue to have a very positive impact on our fortunes going forward in terms of um, opportunities to access capital and market opportunities for the products here in North America. Great. Uh, second question, has the Thunder Bay Joint Refinery Agreement uh, been affected in any way by the new processing acquisition in Matheson? Um, no, not really. Um, the facility that we acquired there as part of that deal on uh, in Matheson is um, basically a demonstration scale facility designed for industrial minerals. So it has some um, a different purpose, but we can probably take advantage of it for um, maybe doing some of the pilot test work on our um, pedalite ore there for making some of the uh, trial quantities of the product for the um, 
uh, glass ceramic customers out there. But we're also looking at it as an opportunity to um, use for our dormant Warren Township calcium feldspar project. It's well equipped to um, do different types of industrial minerals and um, we intend to take advantage of it for producing some of those um, test samples and being able to deliver to customers as well as other um, industrial mineral opportunities that are present it at the um, Cargill site and some of the other assets that we're acquiring as part of that deal. Excellent, great. Uh, now sort of a two-part question uh, for Nacho. Uh, any plans to sell off the basal zone deposit in the future or, or does Avalon plan to hold on to it? And if so, what's the timeline on development? Well, no, we have no plans to uh, sell it off. And um, because of the, the circumstance we have there now with um, Cheetah developing the near surface resources, our vision is to actually ultimately um, work with them down the road and basically put it all back together again and have kind of a jointly owned uh, operation. We just needed someone that could uh, go in and get it started so we can come in behind it. And that's still our vision. Oh, okay. Uh, a bit of a, a macro question. Where do you expect Avalon to be uh, one year from now? <laughs> well, uh, hopefully we'll be um, a revenue generating company. The, um, the tailings that are in that um, Cargill project actually have enough phosphate in them that there's an uh, immediate opportunity to generate uh, revenue streams by sales of that material for uh, fertilizer applications. Phosphate's in short supply right now, and um, there's surprisingly high levels of phosphate in the tailings there. So that's um, a good opportunity for us to take advantage of to establish um, a, an initial revenue stream that will allow us to close that whole deal and um, grow the business going forward through further processing and recovery of some of the uh, trace elements that are in those same phosphate bearing uh, minerals in that resource. At the same time, we're hopefully gonna be in the construction phase for uh, getting our lithium operation going. Expect news on the uh, joint Rock Tech project in Thunder Bay. Um, hard to predict exactly, but um, we've um, got a number of initiatives on the go there to um, access uh, funding for getting the next steps moving forward there. So um, stay tuned. There's quite plenty of interest, and we should have news within the next uh, month or so. Uh, I think I'll just do one more question, uh, and then if anyone's question in the chat has not been answered, we will try to get back to you uh, after the meeting. Uh, so finally, Don, what is the feeling of surrounding communities to our mining operations? Sorry, which communities? Uh, any of the surrounding communities to our operations, uh, how do they feel about Avalon? Uh, we've been fortunate in that we've had very good support from the local communities um, and everywhere where we um, are active right now, including in Nova Scotia, where um, I was talking about East Kempville. In fact, a lot of that community was very disappointed to hear that we uh, were unable to um, find agreement there with the surface rights holder to move that project forward. But we have a very good relationship with the um, First Nation at at White Dog, Wops Among Independent Nations. They're keen to see this uh, operation um, get underway so they can take advantage of the opportunities that will be uh, created for them in terms of local economic development. And um, we're, same thing with all of our projects, actually. I, uh, that's pretty much it from the, from the questions. I don't know if, uh... Don, uh, any last words? Um, 
I think I've covered pretty much everything. Did I forget anything, Mary? <laughs> I think you covered it quite well. Um, so if there's nothing else at this time, as I say, we will um, get back to a couple of the other questions that are just sort of coming in here by email afterwards. But otherwise, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Okay, thanks everyone for uh, listening and I uh, really appreciate all you longtime shareholders for your loyal support and I'm pretty confident that your patience is going to be rewarded this year. <laughs>